seated. We come now to the reading and preaching of God's Word, and we continue our walk through the book of Matthew. Coming this morning to Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. If you're using your pew Bible, you can find us on page 818. Now before we actually hear God's Word read, and hear God speak to us preach Word, I invite you to join me in prayer, asking that God might have us receive that which he has for us this morning. Please join me. Lord God, we come before you this morning, thanking you and praising you, that you speak to us in a special way through your preached word. So we ask, Lord, you might do that this morning. Help us, Lord, to see the answer to this question, why do you speak in parables? Enable us, Lord, to understand that your disciples see and understand your truth because they've been changed and made new. May we, Lord, grasp what Jesus is telling us this morning, how parables show true faith. Lord, I ask you to be with me, your servant. Let the words I speak be not my own, but you speaking through me, Lord, to bring about your purposes, to transform, to save and to sanctify. And Lord, as you do this, may we all be truly changed. May we live out our faith, Lord, and do it in a way that brings glory to you. For we ask this in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen. So Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 10. Hear now God's holy and ever infallible word, a text that shows us how parables show true faith. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he'll have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you'll indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. You ever wonder why someone does what they do? You know what they want, you know what they're after, and so their actions seem to make no sense. It's kind of contrary to what they're after. Think about the guy who says, I want to see souls saved, I want to evangelize, I want to change people's lives. But yet, the way he lives his life, the things he chooses to do, raises a question in your mind. Why would he do this? The woman says she loves Jesus, but yet the way she goes about her daily living makes you wonder and ask, why? Why would you do this if you love Jesus? See, it's very common to have these things happen. And then you speak to these men and these women, and you tell them what you're doing is inconsistent with what you say. And what happens? They put their fingers in their ears, they don't want to hear, and their hearts grow dull and they fail to see the truth. That's the problem we have. We fail to see the truth that God lays out in his word when our hearts grow dull. You know why? Because when we see the truth, we close our eyes. When we hear the truth, we put our fingers in ears. And that's why Jesus does what he does here this morning. He answers a question the disciples have. See, what is Jesus doing? Jesus comes declaring the kingdom of heaven, saying the Messiah has come. But he's doing this by speaking in parables. And that makes no sense to the disciples. They're thinking, if you want people to understand this, then speak more clearly. Don't use parables. So they ask the question, why do you speak in parables? So Jesus answers this question. And in his answer, you see, he shows a distinction between his disciples and everybody else. And through this, he shows what I want you to see this morning, how parables show true faith. So let's listen in as Jesus explains why he speaks in parables. And here's what I want you to see this morning. First, Parables hide the truth. Second, the truth shows fulfillment. And third, fulfillment 
blesses you. And this brings us to our big idea. I want you to hear these words, get them down. Let this cause you to see how truly blessed you are if you can read and understand God's word. Here's your big idea. You're blessed because you see the truth. So first, parables hide the truth. Have you ever heard someone say they don't read God's word because they don't understand it? They read it, but they get nothing out of it. And there can be understanding for that. Maybe the reality is they're a new believer. They don't quite understand everything. They don't understand the nuances or the finer delicacies of God's word. They need more training and teaching. That could be a reason. Or it could be maybe, just maybe, they don't understand God's word because they don't know who God is. They don't belong to him. See, because here's the thing. Unbelievers, they read God's word, it means nothing. So they just move on. But believers, when they read and understand, you know what they do? They ask questions. That's what you're seeing right here. The world thinks, I know the answer. I don't need to ask any questions. But disciples, they know. They want to grow. So they ask questions. And through this, you see Jesus showing a distinction, a difference between his disciples and everyone else. And through this, he shows how parables show true faith. Because what do disciples do? When they don't know something, they ask questions. And they listen when Jesus speaks. Look how your text begins. Look here, verse 10. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? At this point in time, I want you to notice something. We've just seen one parable. Last week, the parable of the sower. But look at your text. It says parables, plural. What does that tell us? That Jesus regularly spoke in parables to the people. We don't have every parable he spoke recorded in the Bible. We have what, he need to, what we need to know. But you see right here, a regular practice of Jesus was to speak in parables. And that's why the, the disciples asked the question they do. I want you to look at their question very carefully. Look at what he says here again. Why do you speak to them in parables? You see that phrase, that prepositional phrase, to them? That's key for understanding what's going on in our passage here. Look at those words, to them. That shows the distinctions being drawn. That's like an us versus them situation. And here you're seeing the us is Jesus' disciples and the them is the rest of the world. So ask yourself, who are you? Where do you fit? Are you a disciple or are you part of them? See, right here you're seeing that Jesus speaks to them in parables. But what's going on? His disciples are asking him a question and he's speaking differently to the disciples. He's answering their question. And it shows you something. What's a parable? We saw it last week. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly message. It's got some moral purpose. So Jesus is speaking to them in parables because it's a powerful teaching tool. And what it does is it shows how you see the distinction between God's people and everyone else. Because to properly understand a parable, you need some foundational knowledge and understanding. You need to know who Christ is. You need to have that spirit-wrought union that draws you close to Christ. Otherwise, it'll make no sense. That's what you're seeing right here. What do you see? Parables are difficult to understand. So you've got to stop and ask questions. That's what the disciples do. So ask yourself, what do you do? Do you desire to know because you desire to grow? Or are you content to say, you know what, I think I know enough. I'm good. I don't need anything more. See, right here you're seeing the disciples, they ask questions because they want to know, because they want to grow. So ask yourself, are you a perpetual learner? Can you not get enough of God's word? Do you want more and more of it and increase your understanding? Or are you more concerned about what's going on in the world? What's your focus? What's your priority? See, Jesus is doing what? He's talking to his disciples who are asking a question. Why do you speak to them in parables? Showing that distinction. And so what are they doing? They're showing that they're disciples because they want to grow. And how do you see they want to grow? Because they want to know. That's why they ask the question they do. And this shows how parables show true faith. It's seen in the willingness to admit you don't know everything, that you can learn more. So you stop and you ask some questions and you humbly listen when Jesus answers. And that's what you see right here. Look at verse 11. Look what it says. And he answered them, to you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. This again shows you right here a distinction, and it makes clear that parables hide the truth. What's going on? They want to know. The disciples are asking, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus now shows why he does that. 
And he shows through this how parables show true faith. Because look what Jesus says. Look at your text again. To you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. You know what doctrine you're seeing right here? This is the doctrine of election. Jesus is making clear they don't, they haven't been given something. That's why I speak to them in parables. But to you, it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Think about that language. It's been given. That shows you something. That's what you see Paul writes in Ephesians 2.8, that your faith is not something you acquire for yourself. You don't work harder to figure it out. You don't read God's word and put the pieces of the, pieces of the puzzle together. But instead, it's a gift that God gives you. That's why Ephesians 2.8 says it's a gift from God. So right here you're seeing what? It's been given to you to know what? The secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Now understand, when it says secret, it's not talking about some mystery you got to figure out. Like again, some puzzle you got to put together. The word mystery, the word secret, comes from the Greek word mysterion. It means something previously hidden but now revealed. And that's what you're seeing right here. Jesus comes proclaiming the kingdom of heaven and saying what's already been said in the Old Testament. The prophets of old pointed to it. And he's the Messiah, and he's saying, I'm the Messiah they talked about, but people don't see it. You know why? Because it's not as clear in the Old Testament. It's a little bit harder to see. You need more information. You need to know. So that's what he's doing right here. What does Jesus do? He comes to open your eyes so you can see the truth. And how does he do that? By leaving his throne in heaven to take humanity to himself, to do for you what you could never do for yourself. It's why he obeys the law perfectly and goes to the cross and serves as your once for all perfect atoning sacrifice. He dies that you might live. And you're seeing this, that he's the promised Messiah way back in the Old Testament. But to understand that, he has to do something. He has to live and he has to die. And he has to rise from the grave and ascend on high and send the Spirit to do what? To open your eyes so you can see the truth. And when your eyes are open, guess what? You see how blessed you are. And now God excites you. You can't wait to be in worship. You can't wait to be in his word. Suddenly you think like an earthly party just doesn't compare. So ask yourself, where do you stand? What excites you? What gets you truly eager? I want to be there. I want to do this. See, right here you're seeing that God has given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. That is if you belong to him, if you've been called to him. That's why he says again, to you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But look how he goes on in verse 11, showing that contrast conclusively. Verse 11 ends, but to them it has not been given. This drives home that contrast between Jesus' disciples and everyone else. It's a contrast between the elect and the non-elect. And that's why parables hide the truth, because parables show true faith. See, they're a teaching tool that Jesus employs to drive home how you can see a disciple because a disciple wants to know more. But one whose heart's grown cold to her God, he could care less. So how do you see the difference? Ask yourself, where do you fall? Do you desire to know more? Can you not get enough of God's teaching? When Grace Church offers some teaching too, are you here saying, give me more? Or you say, you know what? I got better things to do. I got a cupcake at home waiting for me. That's what excites me. Where do you fall? Ask yourself, what do you do when you hear something hard in God's word? Something that says what you're doing is not proper. Your position makes no biblical sense. Or your actions are contrary to what you profess or what you say. When someone points that out to you, what do you do? What is it you hear? Unfair criticism? You're attacking me, judging me, I'm leaving? Or do you hear God speaking to you saying, I want you to know so you can grow? Because when you hear that, then you see how blessed you are because your eyes have been opened to see the truth. And then what happens? God's word starts to make sense, even parables which are difficult to understand. See, what is God doing here? He's making clear why Jesus speaks in parables. And through that, he's showing how parables show true faith. So ask yourself, when you come to worship and you hear God's word preached from the pulpit and your heart is pricked, how do you respond? What do you do? Do you get mad and angry and walk away and say, I'm not going back? Or do you say, thank you, God, for showing me what I needed to see, for helping me to hear what I needed to hear, for helping me to understand so I can grow. Thank you for letting me know so I can grow in my faith. What do you do? Ask yourself. When God speaks, 
Are you inclined to obey or simply to go your own way? It all comes down to whether you're a disciple or not. Because disciples want to know. And why do they want to know? That's why they ask questions. That's what you're seeing right here. If you're an unbeliever, you'll flee. If you're a disciple, you'll stay and say, teach me more. I want to know. That's what you're seeing right here. Disciples want to know, so they ask questions. And what happens? You ready for this? God gives you a great promise right here in your text. If you want to know, you're going to know and get even more. Look what he says. Look at verse 12. For the one who has, more will be given, and he'll have an abundance. How great is that? You got a question, God says, I'm going to answer it and tell you so much more. And you see right here why parables hide the truth. Because a disciple wants to know, but an unbeliever could care less. When you want to know, what do you do? You take the time to dig deeper. Notice how verse 12 begins. It says four. That's showing you why Jesus speaks in parables. It's to show who belongs to him and who doesn't. And how do you see it? Because disciples, they want to know. They want to grow. So they dig deeper and they ask questions. That's how parables show true faith. Because what does it do? It forces you to dig deeper into God's word to increase your knowledge and your understanding. That's what's in view right here. And you have that great promise that if that's what you desire, that's what God will give you. Don't think you can't learn God's word. You can. It just takes more and more time, more and more teaching, more and more training. The willingness to take hold of the tools that are offered. You see it right here. For the one who has, more will be given and will have an abundance. This phrase is not, is not just seen right here. It's repeated elsewhere in the New Testament. Mark 4.25 and Luke 8.18 use the exact same phrase about having abundance, be given more. And that's been connection with the lamp under the basket. And you saw the same thing earlier in the service when we read Luke 19. Luke 19.26 says what? You'll have an abundance in connection with what? The 10 minutes. And that shows what's in view here. It's not monetary or physical. It's not health and wealth. Jesus is not saying, claim it and claim it. What you're seeing here is spiritual knowledge and truth. It's not an issue, issue of the rich get richer while the poor get poorer, but rather it's an idea of those who belong to Christ, those who are disciples, they ask questions because they want to know. And as you want to know, God promises you will grow. He'll increase your knowledge and you'll have an abundance. That's what you're seeing right here. Think about how this is. Think about what you're seeing. Parables are complex. They take more understanding. Know what that shows you? You cannot understand complexity unless you get basic knowledge down. That shows you something. You need to be a disciple. You need to understand who Jesus Christ is, what he's done, how he changes you and makes you new. And that opens your eyes so you can understand deeper things. But if you're not a disciple, you read it, you say, I don't understand it. You close your Bible and go home. Makes no sense. I don't need it. If God wanted me to know, he'd make it clearer. So where do you stand? What do you do? Think of it like this. Think about your body, your muscles. If you sit at home on your couch all day long, drinking your Pepsi and eating your chips, are your muscles going to grow or are they going to atrophy? They're going to get weaker and weaker. And the same is true with your faith. If you don't use it, you don't exercise it, you don't put it into practice, you know what happens? It gets weaker and weaker and your understanding gets less and less. That's the idea. Think of it like this. Could you imagine? My kids deal with this all the time. Try and explain something like how TikTok videos work. To somebody like me, who don't even understand Instagram or Facebook. They try to, they're like, scratching, this is so basic. That like, makes no sense to me. So how about you when it comes to God's word? Can you understand it? Or it's like, it makes no sense to me. It all depends on what matters most to you. So ask yourself, what are you more proficient with? Facebook and TikTok videos or God's word? What do you spend your time with? What gets your priority? What excites you? A new TikTok video? Look at what it can do. 30 seconds of dancing. Oh, what a wonderful thing to see. Or God's word and seeing some new truth that you missed before the 17 times you read it before. How exciting is that? Do you ever do that? Come on and say, I saw something God's word I haven't seen before. How exciting is that? Does that get you excited? That at all. If you're a disciple, that's what will happen. If you're not, you say, show me some TikTok videos. See, that's what Jesus is showing right here. That if you want to grow, you'll ask questions, and he promises you'll increase in your knowledge, you'll have an abundance. But that's not the case for those who don't belong to him. Disciples increase their knowledge, but unbelievers, you might say they get dumber and dumber, because even what they have is taken away. You know what that means? People hear the same parables, but they get different interpretations and different results. 
Look at your text. Look at verse 12. Look how it ends. Even what he has will be taken away. You see that language? What's Jesus making clear? He's showing a distinction between his people and everyone else. And this is why parables hide the truth. Because those who don't know, even the little knowledge they have, will be taken away. They'll lose that basic knowledge. It's been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And as you want to know more, you ask questions, your knowledge will grow. You'll have an abundance. But not others. Those who don't want to know, even what you have will be taken away. So ask yourself, what is it you're after? Is it greater understanding and knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven? Or is it just more temporary earthly delights? What do you spend your time doing? Throughout our days, we we'll always have free time. Ask yourself, what do you do with it? What matters most to you? Is it God's word, God's knowledge, or temporary earthly delights that satisfy you for a moment and then they go away? See, here's the thing. If you're a disciple, you actually ask questions because you want to know. And you listen when God speaks. Because what happens? God changes you. He brings you from death to life. Opens your eyes through that spirit brought union. So now you can live a different way. And through this you see how you understand parables. And you understand why Jesus is making clear. Parables show true faith. So may I ask you again, where do you stand? If it's with Jesus, then praise God because you're blessed. Because he's changed you and made you new and opened your eyes to see the truth, to understand it, to ask more questions when you don't. And that's how you see what blessing really is. It's not health and wealth. It's not fortune and fame. It's understanding God's word. What is Jesus making clear here this morning? You're blessed because you see the truth. And that means you can see and understand what God's word says, how it all fits together, covenantal theology at its best, because you're seeing how fulfillment is actually God's plan, which brings us to the second point. The truth shows fulfillment. You ever see something and get the wrong impression? You see a man and woman sitting together, and you think, oh, they must be engaged in some sin. You see some kid running through the church, even in a sanctuary, you think he's undisciplined. Or you see a husband and wife sitting closely together in church, you think they have a wonderful marriage. We're so good at thinking what we see is giving us a true picture. But oftentimes, what you're seeing is not an accurate picture at all. I'm going to shock you here. But men and women can actually be friends and not sin. Kids could run into church, even in sanctuary, and still be disciplined. And people can sit together close in church and not have a close marriage at all. That would be the only time we're close together is in church. See, the problem we have is we see things based on what we want to understand, not what God says. And that's what we show right here. That's why Jesus speaks in parables. So you can see the distinction. Who truly understands it? Parables show true faith. Because when you don't understand a parable, it's because you haven't been changed. You lack the sight to see how God's Old Testament words are fulfilled in the new. But disciples know the truth. They know the truth shows fulfillment. And that's what Jesus is driving at as he shows prophecy being fulfilled. Look at verse 13. Look what it says here. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they don't see, and hearing they don't hear, nor do they understand. The disciples are asking Jesus, why do you speak to them in parables? And now Jesus makes clear why he does. And it's to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah prophesied about 800 years prior. Look what he does. Look how he begins. This is why I speak to them in parables. This is making so clear he's now going to answer the question. They want to know why do you do this, and now he's going to make it clear. And he says, despite seeing and hearing, they refuse to see and hear. They reject the truth. The truth that was held out before them through their fathers, the patriarchs, they refuse to see and hear it, so they reject. And don't miss how the them is the crowd to whom Jesus is speaking. I told you last week there was a difference in these three pericopes. You need to be here each week. You see what? Last week he was speaking a parable of the sower to them. Now who's he speaking to? Not to them, but to the disciples. And what's he doing? Answering questions, making things clearer. Showing a distinction between them and his disciples. The world and everybody else. And through this you're seeing how parables show true faith. Because why? 
Those who reject, it's not because they can't understand. It's because they refuse to see. Look at the language again in your text. Look what it says here. Because seeing, they don't see. And hearing, they don't hear, nor do they understand. This makes so clear. There's a distinction between Christ's family, Christ's church, and everybody else. So where do you fit? And the answer seen, uh, where do you spend most of your time? Where are your feet most often found? In the world or in the church? With Christ or with the world? Right here you're seeing what? These people, the them, they don't see, hear, or understand what Christ says. And how what he's saying is what was said long ago. And how do you see it? Because they don't obey. They go their own way. So how about you? When God speaks to you, are you inclined to obey or do you go your own way? Right here you're seeing the truth shows fulfillment. That's why you see how God's word fits together. And Jesus is making this so clear in verse 14. Look what he says here. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you'll indeed hear but never understand. And you'll indeed see but never perceive. This shows so clearly concretizes how the truth shows fulfillment. That's why people don't follow Jesus. They're just like Israel in Isaiah's day. They're hearing the truth, they're seeing the truth, but they refuse to listen. They put their fingers in their ears and close their eyes. So they say, I don't want to see or hear. That's the idea. So what happens? Isaiah comes preaching exile. If you don't turn and follow God, he's going to send you to exile. And what happens? They don't obey and they get sent into exile. They do just as God said would happen. They went their own way. And as a result, they hear but never understand and see but never perceive. You get that? You go your own way and what happens? You hear but don't understand. You see but don't perceive. This makes clear that unbelievers are without excuse. You can't blame God for not knowing. Everyone sees and hears the truth. And God is so gracious to us, he doesn't just show it to you or speak it to you, he writes it on your heart. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, God writes the truth on our hearts. That means you know the truth. Whether you want to accept it or not, you know it. Whether you want to hear it or not, you know it. Whether you want to see it or not, you know it. You know what God requires. And here's the thing. If you've ever been in worship here at Grace Church, then you know the gospel. You've heard it. You know that Jesus was born of a virgin. You know why that matters. He must be born of a virgin. That supernatural generation. So he's not tainted by sin. So he can do what? Obey the law perfectly. Because that's what God requires. Perfect obedience. And we can't do that on our own. So Christ does it for us. That's why he goes to the cross and dies. Not for his sins, but for yours. You get that? You may think it's no big deal to shirk your responsibility, to give a little white lie, to do something God's opposed to. But Christ had to die for that. Sheds his blood for that. And what happens? God shows you where your hope is. Because he lifts Christ up from the grave, has him ascend on high, and sends the Spirit to do what? Equip, enable, and empower you to know what the truth is and to actually do it, to live it out. So here's the thing. If you don't follow Jesus, then you'll see and hear the word and you won't care. You'll close your eyes and clog your ears. And that means it's not God's fault. It's your choice. It's your doing. It's your stubborn heart that refuses to see what God shows you or hear what God says. If you don't know the truth, it's not God's fault. It's your doing. Ask yourself, how do you spend your days? What do you do? Ask yourself, what will you now do? Now that you hear God says he wants you to follow him. We continue to go your own way, or will you stop and listen, ask some questions, and obey? You need to ask yourself, what will you do? Israel, like the people of Jesus' day, they were putting their fingers in their ears. I don't want to hear. And they went their own way, refusing to listen. And what happens? They get sent into exile. So how about you? What are you going to do? Are you going to listen to what God says? You're going to see how you're blessed because you can hear the truth because your eyes have been opened. What will you do? When Scripture challenges your thinking or your worldview, what do you do? Just close your Bible and say, I don't like that. I'm not going to read that anymore. Or do you listen? 
Ask some questions. Learn. Want to know so that you can grow. See, the truth shows fulfillment. And what you see through that is parables show true faith. If you lack true faith, then it's because your heart's grown dull toward God. That's what Jesus makes clear here. Look at verse 15. Look what he says here. For this people's heart has grown dull. This drives home the reason behind unbelief and disobedience. Look at verse 15 again. It begins with one key word. It says for. That's providing the reason behind their unbelief, their disobedience. They're seeing but not perceiving. They're hearing but not understanding. It's because even though they see who Jesus is, hear what he says, they refuse to accept it. And why is that? Because their hearts have grown dull. So what does this mean? What's a dull heart? And how does a heart grow dull? A dull heart is one that is no longer excited by God. Like God's just not enough. I need something more. I need these temporary earthly delights to get me excited. God, nah, no big deal. That's a dull heart. And how does that happen? You know how it happens? As you get further and further away from God, as you start to drift, because he's no longer enough. Think about a large glacier. It looks like it's standing still. But what's it doing? It's slowly drifting, slowly but surely drifting further and further away from the shore. And what happens? It weakens and begins to melt. The same is true with your faith. As you drift further and further away from God, your faith weakens and your heart grows dull. That's the idea. How does this happen? It's when you start drifting away. Suddenly, being in worship is not enough. I need something more. Reading God's word doesn't excite you anymore. So what are you doing? What used to be everyday readings become, eh, maybe once a week. Need to do better. Prayer, no longer hourly, not even daily. It's like, yeah, once in a while when I got time. And Christ in his church, eh, if I got nothing else, nothing else to interfere with, then I'll be there. What are you seeing with that? Hearts growing dull, slowly drifting away. And you know what happens? Suddenly, being in worship every week no longer matters. It's enough to be there every other week, maybe three times a, you know, three times a month, maybe once a month. And when you show up to worship, you come in late and you leave early. You know why? Because your heart's grown dull. God doesn't excite you anymore. You're not the first at the door and the last to leave. You want to be around Christ and his people. It's just not enough. You want some earthly delight that's going to pass and quickly fade. Ask yourself, where do you stand? See, here's the problem. When your heart grows dull, even something as basic as a kid's birthday party on Sunday at 11 o'clock is enough to keep you out of worship. Could you imagine that being enough to keep you out of worship? But that's what people do. Where do you stand? What excites you? Where are your feet found? Jesus makes clear here that people drift from God because their hearts grow dull. And it's not God's fault. It's the choices you make. And you see this. You see how it's yours doing. Look at verse 15. Look how it goes on. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they've closed. Lest they would see with their eyes and ears, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn and I would heal them. Do you see again how God shows what you do matters? And he gives you a great promise. These words show how truth shows fulfillment, just as Isaiah prophesied. What do you see here? Jesus is talking to them, the crowds of his day. They're much like the people today. We're no different. Isaiah's day, Jesus' day, and today, we're all the same. We refuse to listen to God. Why? Well, look what Isaiah says. Their eyes they've closed. You know what that's saying? God didn't close their eyes. You close your own eyes. You clog your own ears. You say, I don't want to see or hear. I want to do my own thing. That's the idea. But listen, you need to understand something. Don't convince yourself that God doesn't care about your little sin. That's no big deal. Somehow God's still pleased with you. God cares very much about sin. That's why Christ had to die on the cross. Every little sin matters. It may not seem like a big deal to you. What do you think Christ thinks about when he's dying on the cross? Think he's got a different perspective? Do you have that perspective, that your sin causes Christ to die? Do you think God understands, I'll be fine, I can do these other things, that won't grow my faith, it won't teach me anything more, but that's okay. God's okay with it, because I'm okay with it. What's your position? Where do you stand? Do you believe that your heart can become dull toward God? Or you think, not my heart. My heart would never grow dull toward God. I don't have to read my Bible, go to worship, be around Christ's people, I'll be just fine. Where do you stand? Hear what you're seeing right here. God's making clear. They close their eyes. That means they're willingly refusing to see. Here's the thing. 
If you spend your days in the world chasing after earthly pleasures and delights, your heart will grow dull. Because what ought to excite you is God and his word, Christ and his church. So again, ask yourself, does that excite you? What gets you eager and excited to be around? And notice what Jesus is saying here. He's showing God is sovereign, but don't think that means you have no responsibility. God's sovereignty works with human responsibility. That's why he says, with their heart, they would turn. And I would what? I would heal them. Look, listen again to this word. Look at your text again. Lest they should see with their ear, eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. That's a promise of hope right there. You know what that's saying? You don't have to stay drifting further and further away, but you can come back. What do you need to do? Stop closing your eyes, take your fingers out of your ears, and turn to Christ. If you're here this morning and you've never done that, let today be the day of your salvation. Do what you need to do. Confess your sin, repent, and turn to Christ. And if you're a believer, but you're drifting away, do the same. Confess your lacking of doing what God says. You're drifting, and repent, and turn back to Christ. Look what he says. I will heal them. That's a promise. That should give you hope. That shows a distinction between them and Christ's disciples. And it shows how parables show true faith. Because when you have true faith, you trust in God's promises. You obey what he says. You go his way. That's the idea. And that means you can now see properly. Your eyes are open to see the truth. That's how you're blessed because you understand parables, and you see how it's spoken long ago is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So hear Jesus say, you're blessed because you understand the truth. You see the truth. Seeing the truth is what brings breath blessings, which leads to our third and final point. Fulfillment blesses you. It's not uncommon for two people to see the same thing and have two different interpretations. Like in some churches, not here at Grace Church, kids would never do that here, but in some churches, kids actually run in the sanctuary. And some people look at that and they think, wow, what a disgrace. Kids running in a sanctuary. The church is losing control. They're falling into anarchy. Other people look at that and they see what? What a blessing. This church so loves kids, let them be kids where they can. I wish I could run in the sanctuary. How do you see it? See, we see the same things. We have different interpretations. And the same thing happens with parables. That's how parables show true faith, by how you understand them. Jesus speaks in parables to be able to identify who belongs to him. Who's his disciples? They're the ones who understand what he means. And that means they do what he says. Look at verse 16. Jesus has just finished quoting Isaiah 6. Now he goes on to say, verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, for they see and your ears, for they hear. This moves us to see how fulfillment blesses you. And you see it with that one key word. Look at verse 16. It begins, but. He's contrasting those having dull hearts, so they close their eyes and clog their ears and don't understand the truth, contrasting that with Jesus' disciples. Those who are blessed. Why? Because your eyes see and your ears hear. They don't because their hearts have grown dull. What's he saying? They're that way, but not you. Does that give you hope? As Christ's disciple, you can see what he puts out before you. You're blessed, why? Your eyes for they see, and your ears for they hear. This means, if you grasp what Jesus says about being a promised Messiah, what it says back in the days of Isaiah, the Messiah will come, and it'll be what? The one who's God himself, who takes humanity to himself. Born of a virgin, so he could do what? Obey the law perfectly. Fulfill everything that needed to be done as the second Adam, do what the first Adam failed to do. And go into the cross, shedding his blood to purchase your pardon and set you free. So your eyes are open. And how are your eyes open? Because he rises from the grave and ascends on high. He must ascend for the spirit to descend and change you, make you new. And when your eyes are open, then you see how you're truly blessed. Even if you don't have health and wealth, fortune or fame. Because you recognize that doesn't, that's not what blesses you. What blesses you is knowing who Christ is, understanding what God says, and be able to follow it and do it. Coming to see how you are saved, not by your works, not by what you do, but by the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that excites you. That makes you say, praise Jesus, I want to be around him more and more. 
Suddenly, having time with my cat's not enough. I need Jesus. I need his people. That's the idea. That's what you're seeing right here. And you know that you belong to Jesus because you understand he's the one who opened your eyes. He called you to himself and enabled you to follow him. Because what happens? His perfect righteousness is imputed to you. That's why the spirit is so important. The spirit must descend to apply to you all the benefits of redemption, make you new. And when you get that, you get to see how parables show true faith. That's what makes the difference. You see the them versus the disciples of Jesus Christ. So ask, let me ask you, where do you fall? Are you part of them wanting to be in the world? Or are you a disciple of Jesus Christ, wanting to be with Christ in his church? See, when you get this, you understand why Christ is so amazing. Because he gives you blessings galore. You want to know? He gives you an abundance. That's the idea. Disciples know. They want to know because they want to grow. And you're seeing what Jesus is driving at right here. Look how he ends our text. Look at verse 17. Shows you just how truly blessed you are. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and didn't see it. And to hear what you hear and didn't hear it. This makes so clear, concretizes how fulfillment blesses you. Look at the language again. Many prophets and righteous people who long to what? See and hear what you see and hear. But they didn't. You get that? It was a distant future for them. They so badly wanted it, but they didn't get it. But not you. What's happened? You live on the other side of the cross. Your eyes have been opened. The Spirit's changed you, made you new. You can look back on what Christ has done, and that shows you the hope you have. Because what? He changes you. Notice how verse 17 begins again. It says four. He wants you to see how truly blessed you are. Do you see that? Do you get how blessed you are? Because you see what they only hope to see. You hear what they only hope to hear. You know that Christ is the promised Messiah. And you know because he's changed you, opened your eyes to see that and know it. That should excite you. Does it? Does that make you say, I want to be more around Christ, more around his church? This means what? You're a disciple because what Christ has done. He's the one that does all the work, but you get all the reward. How great is that? That ought to be worth hearing. That should excite you. That should carry you through the week to next Sunday. That what? You're blessed, not because of what you do, but because of Christ has done. Again, it's not health and wealth, fortune and fame. It's knowing the truth, having your eyes open to see it. And you can do it because Christ has called you to see the truth. So that means what? You can read God's word. You can hear his preached word. You can know who Jesus is because Christ blesses you. He's called you to be his disciple. That's the value of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Your eyes are open. Your ears are unclogged. Your mind's made new so you can understand. And you see why Jesus speaks to them in parables. Because you don't want them to know. Because what have they done? They've closed their eyes and clogged up their ears. But not his disciples. What do you do? You see the distinction. Parables show true faith. As Jesus' disciple, you know you're blessed. And that ought to excite you. That should get you eager to be in God's word every day, to be in prayer all the time, to be in worship every week. So ask yourself, are you still excited by God? Or have your hearts grown dull? Are you slowly drifting? Well, hear again what Jesus says. You can return and he'll heal you. That's why you want to be in worship every week. In God's word every day, in prayer every hour, and regularly around Christ and his church. Because that's how your faith is strengthened. And that's how you get to see the blessings of galore that Christ gives you. And then you'll understand what he says right here. You're blessed because you see the truth. Sometimes people do things that make no sense to us. It's almost antithetical to what they say or what they desire, what they hope to accomplish. That's why so many professing believers act as though they're not accountable to God at all. They profess Christ and then live for everybody but him. And that's why Jesus speaks in parables, to show who truly belongs to him and who doesn't, who's part of the them and who's part of the us. What are you seeing right here? A distinction. Just like Isaiah prophesied long ago. What did he say? They'll close their eyes and clog their ears and not understand because their hearts have grown dull. God no longer excites them. So how about you? Does God still excite you? Do you still want to know? Do you still want to grow? The answer depends on whether or not you're a disciple. If you're a disciple, then you're going to take in all the learning you can. When the doors are open, you're going to be here to take in the tools to learn and to grow because you know that's how you grow, by learning. And God promises to do what? To give you an abundance. What you know, be added. You'll know even more. 
And that means you see what? That you're a disciple. Because Christ has opened your eyes to see what he says. Opened your ears to hear the truth. And that shows you that you can understand parables. Because parables show true faith. And that means as a disciple, you are blessed. So leave here with a smile on your face and be excited by God. Because you're blessed. Because you see the truth. Let's pray. Will you join me? Lord God, we come before you this morning thanking you and praising you that we are so blessed because you opened our eyes and helped us to see the truth. We thank you, Lord, for the person and work of Jesus Christ that secures our redemption, sets us free from our sin. So it would help us never lose sight of this fact. May you, Lord, be the one who always excites us. May you be what we most desire. Lord, may we die more and more to the temporary delights of this earth and seek you more and more, Lord. Lord, help us to see how parables show true faith to show who belongs to you. We ask, Lord, you help us to see this. We ask it in Christ's most precious name. Amen.